Hello, I'm Jesse. In my last video, I talked about how the Game Boy maybe decides which memory chip a particular memory address is meant for. One thing I glossed over was how exactly the Game Boy tells individual chips that the CPU is trying to talk to them. The CPU can connect to four memory chips, the video RAM, the work RAM, the cartridge ROM, and the save RAM. The video RAM is connected to the CPU directly and the work RAM, cartridge ROM, and save RAM are all connected to the CPU over shared connections that I called the main bus. If you want to know why the Game Boy has two memory buses, I made a video about it. You may think that the video RAM has it easy, since it's all alone on its own bus. If there's an address on the bus, there's no confusion who it's meant for. But what should the video mm -hmm. RAM do with that address? If the CPU is trying to read from video RAM, then the video RAM chip needs to put data onto the video data bus. If the CPU is trying to write to the video RAM, then the video RAM chip needs to take the data from the video data bus and store it. To tell the difference, the video RAM chip has two pins, Output Enable, or OE, and Write Enable, or WE. When the OE pin is active, then the video RAM chip knows it should be sending data out onto the data bus. When WE is active, it knows it should be storing the data that's on the data bus. The CPU has two pins connecting directly to the WE and OE pins on the video RAM chip so that it can control it. Now over to the main bus, which is shared, so it's more complicated. The shared bus means that when the CPU tries to read memory from the work RAM, cartridge ROM, or save RAM, it will send address signals over the main address bus and that goes to the work RAM, cartridge ROM, and save RAM chips. There's no way to stop those address signals from going to all the chips. That's just how a shared bus works. And keep in mind, the work RAM chip and save RAM chip only need the A0 to A12 address bits. They're not even connected to the rest of the address wires. So to those chips, an address meant for the ROM, work RAM, or save RAM all look the same. If the chips didn't know any better, they'd all just send signals on the data bus, which would cause a mess and we'd never get anything done. There's also OE and WE pins for the main bus, but they're also shared. Good thing there are other control pins though. I'll take this memory chip as an example. It's a flash memory chip that acts a lot like the ROM chip in a Game Boy cartridge. I used it in my very practical homemade flashcard video. It has a bunch of address pins and some data pins. It also has an OE pin and a WE pin, but we need something else to get over our shared bus problems. That's where this pin comes in. It's the chip enable pin, or CE. Some chips might call it chip select, or CS. It's like an on-off switch for the chip. If you want the chip to do anything, it needs to be enabled. To make it enabled, you need to send the right signal to the CE pin. Like the Game Boy, this chip uses 5 volt logic. So the signal is either going to be 0 volts or 5 volts. The CE pin is what's called active low, which means you turn it on with a low or 0 volt signal. The OE and WE pins are also active low, but that wasn't important to mention. The work RAM and save RAM also have CE pins, so that's easy. Just hook up each memory chip CE pin to a pin from the CPU and problem solved. Except nope, that's not how it works. The CPU has a CE pin going onto the main bus, but only one, so it's shared. Plus, if we were to look at the signals on the pin when the CPU is reading from ROM, it doesn't even activate. The CE pin is only connected to the work RAM and save RAM chips, not the ROM chip. The ROM chip needs something connected to its CE pin, though. Since the CE pin is active low, we need something that's low whenever ROM is being accessed, and high otherwise. Conveniently, the addresses that are meant for the ROM are all ones where address bit 15 is 0, and all the non-ROM addresses have address bit 15 equal to 1. So the A15 address wire is actually perfect for connecting to the ROM chip's CE pin. And that's exactly what I did when I made my homemade flashcard. So when A15 is low, the ROM chip knows the address is meant for it. I also said that the CE pin coming out of the CPU isn't active when the CPU is talking to the ROM. That's so that the work RAM and save RAM aren't active when the CPU is talking to the ROM. Of course, when the CPU is talking to the work RAM or save RAM, we only want one of those chips to be active at a time. Luckily, they have a second CE pin. The work RAM second CE pin is active high, which is very convenient. All the work RAM addresses have A14 equal to 1, 
the mirror RAM addresses also have A14 equal to 1. But like I said in the addresses video, that just acts like a copy of work RAM. So A14 is hooked up to the work RAM second CE pin. Now, unfortunately, there's nothing to hook directly up to the work RAM second CE pin, at least if it's active high. If there's a RAM chip with two active low CE pins, then you can use A14 just like for the work RAM and get the opposite behavior. I don't know if RAM chips like that exist. That's not a problem though, because as far as I know, there were never any cartridges made with only a ROM and a RAM chip in them. If the cartridge had RAM, it also had a third chip, called a memory bank controller. I'm hoping to get into more details about what the memory bank controller does in a future video, but the important thing for this video is that it's connected to A14 and uses that to enable the save RAM by being connected to the save RAM second CE pin. Well, I hope that gives you a better idea of how the Game Boy was designed. My favorite part is how A15 is used to control ROM access. It's so simple. If you want to help me make more videos like this, I have a link to my Kofi in the description. And of course, remember to like and subscribe. Bye!